this is a this is a very interesting piece of research. Obstetricians about obstetricians, the obstetricians to which I referred at the top of the hour, uh, helping women through labor and delivery, L and D have a lot of moving parts to assess. Obviously, it's high stakes, high stress job. One of uh, one of the things that they have to decide is what kind of delivery women are going to have. The two. Basically, the two, there's probably other options, but basically vaginal or C-section, cesarean section. Uh, the first being the norm, whether or not it's, and then under certain circumstances, um, C-section is required. And of course, there's a whole lot of literature and thinking on how um, there was a rise in C-sections um, over the last several decades that I think has actually begun to, re- begun to reverse um, because it was sort of, it was too often done for convenience and um, to be able to time birth rather than actually for the good of the mother and the child. Um, but this research finds um, that if an obstetrician, I'll just I'll, I'll put it in a hypothetical term, which is not what the paper does. Um, if an obstetrician has two deliveries in one day, and um, it the mother's uh, the first mother has a vaginal birth, but she has complications that were unexpected. That obstetrician going to the second birth is more likely to direct that mother to and to give that mother a cesarean section than if the first mother had not had complications from a, a V birth, which is both alarming and so very human, uh-huh. right? So it's it is you know the two mothers presumably have no risk factors in common, and certainly the original research made sure that that was the case, um, precluding maybe you know something about the hospital environment that is making one or the other type of delivery particularly dangerous. In which case, that would be a broader scale problem than just this obstetrician, where you know any any hospital but a very rural place is going to have more than one obstetrician working at a time. So the idea that um, whether or not you get shunted into one or the other kinds of modes of delivery is in part predicted by whether or not your obstetrician's previous delivery had complications that he or she wasn't expecting is um, something that women going into labor and delivery and their partners um, and their support um, people need to know, right? Um, But it also points to me um, to, like I said, this kind of human universal, right? That people tend to assume dependence between events that don't have dependence, right? There's no way that two women um, who happen to be giving birth at the same time in the same, say, you know, urban hospital inherently have similar risk factors that were unusual in the first one that would, that would um, make uh, a particular birth more like more difficult Let's slow down slightly. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I just want to point out, this is a very elegant, uh, it's more or less a natural experiment. I hesitate to use the term because usually natural experiment is like different populations on a series of islands or something like that. And obviously there's nothing natural about a hospital. But the idea that the data is generated by just a series of events, it exists there. It's an observational study. It's an observational study that compares two things and assuming a rational model of hazards in uh in giving birth then this does seem to reveal a non-medical pattern yes right this is a pattern of human psychology not a pattern of medical need and it's one with important consequences because these two versions of birth are not uh equivalent in terms of their hazards and benefits on the other hand i mean there let's just try to find a mechanism by which this would actually be rational Mm -hmm. that's plausible i've got one i don't believe it for a second but i know that formally it works okay so let's say that there is a lot more about complications in birth that has to do with the obstetrician, Mm -hmm. right? If the obstetrician is detecting, oh, I, the obstetrician, am having an off day. And as much as I don't like to do C-sections, I don't want to have a complication Mm -hmm. uh, that's unnecessary. So although it's, it's more risky on average when I'm having an off day, it's actually the safer of the two options, right? Then you could find this pattern and it in fact Mm -hmm. would be medical in nature. Yep. Um, And that's, that's true. If, if the complications are downstream of obstetrical behavior, 
then um, this would actually be a, perhaps a, a good finding, a, a, a benef- of benefit to the mothers who are later right. in the day. I'm struggling over the language too, because yeah. if this were <laughs> our native territory, the point is this pattern is either adaptive or not, yeah. right? In this case, I'm using medical as a substitute, meaning right. you know, to the benefit of the patient. Yeah. Um, Again, I don't believe for a second that that's what's going on because right. I think much more often the complications are about, you know, a uh, cord wrapped around the baby's neck. Well, or, and the over-medicalization of the process in the first place, like, you know, lying down, highly drugged, uh, you know, don't move at all be- while you're in labor. You know, there's just a whole lot of stuff that will tend to cause births to become sluggish and slow. And then ultimately at the point the mother's super exhausted, things don't go right instead of, you know, okay, get up, walk around, you know, <laughs> and, you know, let's, let's hasten this process, which is, which is much more likely to result in a safe, excruciating, you know, but um, faster and um, non-complicating vaginal birth. Yes. I will also say as much as I am a firm believer that there is some good method that we could, you know, if we were completely open-minded about what actually works and what actually doesn't, and we, you know, didn't talk ourselves out of stuff, I bet you could find exactly that walk around method or whatever it is, or I know the Russians were experimenting with uh, births into into water and uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah. who knows? Um, but the point is, it may also be that some of this is not solvable because the inputs to the system are novel. In other words, the nutrition that the mother has uh, is also novelly good, right? And mm-hmm. so the baby is likely to be unusually large compared to what an ancestral baby would be, which means that that's the system true. But that doesn't change day to day, right, right? Right, right. That doesn't change. I'm just saying it. You know. Yes, the process has been over-medicalized. It may be the case where it's become somewhat medicalized out of necessity downstream of some kind of novelty like plenty of food. Yes. Um, but, uh, but. But so, certainly some of the medicalization was about sort of, I don't know exactly when, but let's just call it sort of early to mid 20th century, um, taking agency away from mothers as if they were just bystanders, passive bystanders. Just, you know, trust the, trust the authorities who aren't pregnant and not the baby um, to, you know, bring this baby into the world. And you just happen to have like, you know, been the transport or something, which yes. is an insane view. We took the agency away from motherhood at uh, mothers, and now we're taking the motherhood away from mothers by gender neutralizing the process. <laughs> because we've gone batshit crazy. Yes, yes. I, mm, I, <laughs> I'm not going to go there today, but I did on Twitter this week. Oh, my God. It's... Yeah. Now, we can talk about differences in... Um, in how male fetuses and female fetuses and the placentas. So like placentas are fascinating, actually. And I did not do my research before saying anything here, but there's like at least four different distinct forms of placentals among placental mammals. Different evolutions. It seems like it. I I didn't say that because I'm, you know, I think, I think, I think that we think that plus Placental mammals, eutherians, eutherians, the so-called true mammals, yep. as opposed to like kangaroos, <laughs> middle mammals, as opposed Pretend to mammals. The, you know, the middle mammals, as opposed to the monotremes, the echidnas, and the duckbill platypus. Um, the placentals, which includes basically everything you can think of except all the mammals in Australia plus possums, um, and not also the platypus and the echidnas, um, are the placental mammals, the eutherians. Um, I, I think there's something like four, maybe more different maybe evolutions of placenta. And um, in at least one of them, I think the placenta is maybe entirely maternally derived. And at least in one of them, I think it's entirely fetally derived. Mm -hmm. But in us and our close relatives and some other group, I don't remember which, it's both. Um, So our placentas are a a mixture of maternal and fetal genes, which is just in and and cells. And these things have, it will not be obvious to most of our listeners, but this has profound found implications over the mediation of the conflict between fetus and mother, yeah. which will be will vary quite a bit based on the mating system of the species in question. So there's a right. kind of whole hidden landscape of conflict here. Yes. Um, based yes. on because essentially if let's say you have a species that mates for life, right? If you have a species that mates for life, there's very little basis for a conflict between the fetus and the mother over how much 
resource to deliver. It's not zero, but the offspring has an interest in the mother remaining uh, healthy at the end of the pregnancy because all future offspring will be full siblings, mm -hmm. right? At the point that the baby is effect is produced inside of a species in which that is not the expectation, then the point is actually draining the mother of more resources than it is in her interest to give up actually makes some kind of sense. And so the placenta is in a perfect position to to mediate this and uh, which kind of placenta it is, is going to have an effect over, you know, who has the upper hand or is it a stalemate? Yeah, very much so. So sort of downstream of David Higgs work in the early mid nineties. Absolutely.